I would like to welcome you to the session that will analyze the trends, challenges, and opportunities in the life sciences sector. And I would like to start with a snapshot of the Israeli scene. Israel is currently considered first in the world in medical devices patent per capita, fourth for biopharma patent. It has the highest civilian R&D budget per GDP, 4.6% of the world. Although our GDP is low, still it's a great uh, figure, and it is fourth in investment in biotechnology per GDP. There are more than 13 drugs in advanced clinical trials. We are third in Europe in this respect, and Israel is rated between the one to three world leaders in medical uh, device area. Uh, figures show that Israel uh, is the world largest, has the low, world largest number of scientists per capita, and uh, one third of Israel research devoted, is, is devoted to life sciences. Now, the characteristics that uh, enable this position is probably the productive academic environment, the entrepreneurial spirit of people both in academia and in the uh, R&D section in, uh, in the industry, creative fusion between industry and academia, and convergence of science and driven uh, technologies. Now, uh, we definitely, in the medical device sector, this convergence approach is, uh, is very important. Also, foreign, foreign investment and strong VC sector contribute to this position. And I would like to uh, put some emphasis also on government incentives that are uh, including grants to support industrial R&D, which is sort of unique uh, way of supporting R&D in the industry rather than R&D only in the academia, uh, and namely the specific programs for industry and academia technology transfer and frameworks to facilitate international and global collaborations. Now, I'll just bring some figures, and I will not go into all the details because I would like the other panels to dis discuss their uh, topics as, as well. Uh, these are the patent position, the world position. Um, I think these are 2006 figures showing Israel first in medical device uh, patent. Now, when you look on Israel life sciences industry, uh, we have Almost 800% companies now, it's seven, 720 uh, was the number which was uh, about a year ago. It's a rate of over 50 companies being generated a year. It's, this is part of the uh, entrepreneurial spirit of the people in Israel. However, I agree with uh, Uziah Galil that uh, we do need to cluster them and this uh, flow of small companies is a disadvantage in a way. Uh, as you can see, there are 31% 30, of the companies are seed at the seed stage and only 37% are at the revenue stage. So this is a weakness of the sector. Uh, when you look on the technology distribution, medical devices have more, the majority of uh, companies in the life sciences industry. And that's mainly because it's easier to get funds for medical device uh, products. VC sectors would like to have to see an exit in a real, real time. And the uh, pharmaceutical us who is using MEMS micropyramid technology to deliver uh, drugs, mainly vaccines. Epil Pharma, who is trying to develop electrical stimulated um, device to deliver a pharmaceutical drug uh, orally, and BrainsGate, which is uh, developing a delivery system to the brain. Uh, these are solution-driven uh, technologies where you identify the problem and you try to find a solution to tackle the, the problem. I just heard a few months ago from a large pharmaceutical company that they have allocated Israel as the best, uh, or, uh, who has the most solution for drug delivery solution, and that's why they would like to come to Israel and meet those uh, companies. Uh, another area that Israel is uh, quite strong in, and I won't uh, uh, detail it, is, is the regenerative medicine. That's mainly because we'll hear later on lecture and talks about uh, this technology. Now, uh, looking globally, Israel is rated um, 
15, was rated 15 in 2006 at the competitive index uh, ranking generated by the World Economic Forum. However, in 2007, we are at the 17th position. And the reason is, I mean, and the countries which are preceding us are Taiwan, China, and the Korean Republic. Um, this ranking is, a, is driven by several parameters, many parameters actually going to, to, to do with science, business, economic, financial, society. But if you look on several of the parameters, like quality of scientific research institutes, Israel is rated third. Why? It's, oh, I don't know why it's... Uh, I would like to keep it. Uh, knowledge, tra knowledge transfer, Israel is rated fourth. However, in medical device quality management system, Israel is very, very low in the um, rating. So there is a lot for us to do there. Now I'll just uh, probably end with looking on the global world, and we know that economic growth is moving towards emerging countries. 80% of customers in 2025 are forecasted to be in the emerging market. There is shrinking in age and population in Japan and Europe where Asia is growing. And the forecast GDP uh, for China and India is around 8%, whereas in the US and Europe is around 2%. Another issue is innovation and internal R&D spending in, em in emerging countries. And why is it running? I I'm not touching anything. <laughs> and, and China. <laughs> In China has filed 12% of the total world patent in nanotechnology. So China is doing innovation as well and not only production. Now con there is a continuous increase in cost of de developing treatment and I just heard that even in medical science, in medical devices, uh, instead of, uh, it used, we used to need like $20 million to bring a product to the market, now $100 million is the minimum. I'm fighting this, I don't touch anything. Okay, so I just wanted to, co to conclude that there is a great science and we have to find a way to better deliver it to the people and there is a great market for that. And uh, also tell, tell my thought that innovation should go beyond technology. And I think we'll hear things about it later on. So I now will move to our panel and uh, which will address some of the issues that I've just raised. And the first speaker in this panel is Professor George Solovich, who will talk on changes and trends in the global medical sector. His talk will actually explore the increasing challenge of developing and commercializing medical products and medical systems. I think we've been asked not to actually tell, talk about the CV of the people, they have it. Okay, so please. Okay. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Michael, for inviting me. And I see some old friends and some new friends in the audience uh, from, from far away. So it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, Mr. Galil gave some of my talk already. We've never met, but it's a good thing that we're of a similar mind because you'll see some continuity. So what I'd like to talk about, the, the theme was next generation medical product systems and services, and I'd like to talk about products, systems, and services, and what's going on in general in the global market. Um, because I only have 30 minutes, I can only talk about so many trends, so I apologize if you have a particular trend that you think is happening. For example, I haven't touched on nanotechnology, which is extremely important, uh, something, for example, that Northwestern is very strong in, so I apologize to any colleagues uh, whose interests I've omitted. So one of the things that we're looking at is how we can translate what global trends into actual products that are going to make money. I mean, that's sort of one of the themes here. So, you know, you're in the bed and you see somebody and says, my God, this is expensive, but it's meeting my particular need, run out and buy me some shares. But before we look at that, we have to say, if I'm interested in global opportunities, 
how can I possibly look at a country and figure out that country? And so I've just given you a very brief framework. I might uh, um, unapologetically promote a new book that, that's out with, with Phil Kotler and Bob Stevens. It's coming out on, on healthcare marketing. And this model's explained a little bit more. But if you're going to drop down in a country and understand the particular needs, there are certain questions you have to ask. So, for example, who's paying? We talked about that. It's very important. How much are they going to pay? There's cost budgeting issues. Who or what is going to be covered? If your product or, or service is not going to be covered, you might as well not do it. Where is the care going to be provided? And who is going to provide the services and products? But there's a lot of different dimensions to that. So we can talk about political, regulatory, and judicial dimensions, economic, social, and cultural, technological, demographic. And in order to understand healthcare systems, you have to understand each one of those dimensions. And because there's only, again, half an hour, what I'm going to do is to touch briefly on some of those individual questions and issues. So the first is safety. And I know Mr. Galil said that safety is important, but there's other issues. Um, safety is actually becoming a lot more important globally. And one of the issues, for example, in particularly in the United States, is we've had a lot of products from China. And a lot of the products from China, as you know, contain lead. It's very toxic. And there's been a number of other issues. Propylene glycol, as you know, has found its way into a lot of medications. So safety is really the floor that we're talking about on building. And we have to assure that that floor is there before we can build on that. So for example, we look at uh, uh, drugs. The Food and Drug Administration in the United States estimates that 10% of the drugs worldwide are counterfeit. In some countries, more than 50%. Uh, one of our graduates uh, has a company called Nano Inc. that actually puts Nano Inc. on each pill to prevent counterfeiting. So it's, it's really quite interesting. Um, it's not only drugs, though, and that's not the focus of the symposium. It's also devices uh, safety. As you know, just a few weeks ago, Medtronic pulled one of its leads from its defibrillators. This was actually very important. My mother had a pacemaker put in a few days ago. She's home. She's well. Everything's fine. But I was thinking as they were putting in a Medtronic pacemaker, thank God it's now and not a few weeks ago when they discovered lead problems because there were safety issues about the leads breaking. And uh, information systems. While information systems can solve some problems, we have to understand that it can also create some problems. And we have to look at it in a whole systematic view. So a few years ago, researchers at the University of Pennsylvania Hospital found that computerized physician order entry, that's what CPOE is, created 22 types of medication error risks that occurred weekly or, or more often. So while it's solving a lot of problems, it's creating other problems. And we have to look at information systems as a total and anticipate what those problems are going to be. So in the United States, we have this, you know, the secret of happiness. I know what it is, but the FDA won't let me release it. Okay. The next is consolidation that we're seeing in products. And I know that you'll see a lot of this in the pharmaceuticals, so I thought I'd give you something, uh, some weirder things at the edge in uh, medical, pr medical products as opposed to pharmaceuticals. So as you know, a couple of years ago, uh, Boston Scientific, in a very heated uh, bidding war, bought Guidant. And they were bought it mainly for the stents. And in order to do this, our Federal Trade Commission required Guidant to divest itself of its vascular division, which it sold to Abbott for $7.8 billion. And that's sort of a lot of money. So Abbott absorbed it and is doing some good things with it. Uh, but then fairly recently, this past year, Abbott said, you know, we'd like to spin off our diagnostics division to recoup some of the money that we paid for this vascular division that we bought from, Guiden, well, from Boston Scientific in order for, Guiden, uh, for them to do the deal with Guidant. So they were trying to sell the division to General Electric, uh, which would have been a new venture for them. Uh, the deal did not go through. That's what that red slash is. But the reason GE did it was to get into this competitive market because Siemens was getting into the market, the diagnostic market, Siemens Diagnostic. So we're seeing a lot of this competition getting into new areas um, and uh, consolidation. Uh, Medtronic, and I wanted to keep this up to date, this happened yesterday, so these slides are reasonably up to date. 
uh, just bought into a company, the Chinese medical uh, device maker. Um, there it is if you're interested. It's H shares, which are on the Hong Kong exchange. I don't see anybody running out right now, so maybe you can wait till after to call your broker. But we're seeing a lot of this an in international. It's not just within the same country. And this is an, an interesting cartoon for a number of reasons. This is the farm industry, and I realize we're not talking about pharma. But all of these different, this is the pharma company of the future. It's got one huge name, and for U.S. tax reasons, it's based in Puerto Rico. But this cartoon was obviously at least 10 years old. And so we've seen this trend over a longer period of time, but the trend still continues. Third tr a major trend is generics. And I know you know the reason for generics and pharmaceuticals, so I'm not going to really go into it, but just go into a little bit of a fringe areas that are some room for opportunity. First is diversification of generic companies. So first of all, generics are not just for pharma anymore. There are a lot of medical devices that are getting into the generic um, issue and here's one's called generic medical devices in Gig, Gig Harbor, Washington. Ranbaxy, as you know, is a major uh, manufacturer of pharmaceuticals, uh, generic pharmaceuticals in India, and they've gotten into the disease management field. There have been pharmaceutical companies getting into hospitals. Sort of, uh, it depends on where where you are. Forward integrating, I, I suppose, and, and the vertical chain. So there's a lot of consolidation vert and, and, um, and integration in this industry. Number two is that there's more use of economic analysis in time frames. Obviously, people are interested in generics because they're cheaper, and cheaper is obviously better because it makes things more affordable. But we're looking not at just the individual cost of the item. We're looking at the whole cost for the episode of use. And that obviously will involve further use of information systems to capture this entire episode of care. So we're looking more at economic analysis and we're looking over a longer period of time. This is a, a slide that I, we could only get, uh, we, I could only show this because it's an old slide, it's 1994, but it shows ACE inhibitors which are used for a number of things including treating high blood pressure uh, and congestive heart failure. Uh, the first drug in this market was Captopril or Capitin. The next was Enalapril, which was Vasitac, and, and so forth down the line. This is pretty much the order in which they were introduced, but also the order, in, therefore, in which they went generic. And if you look at this, and if you say, well, Captopril uh, would cost this much money, well, it doesn't appear to be very cost effective. On the other hand, if it goes generic, and it was the first drug to go generic, if you can count on reducing this dark, this blue part, by 80 percent and therefore shifting that bar all the way over, you're still not at the point where a branded drug would be, you're still not at the point where that would be cheaper than a branded drug, everything considered. So when you introduce a medical innovation, you have to look not only at the cost of the acquisition cost or what is that cost of innovation, but also what else needs to be done for the patient, what laboratory tests need to be done how many clinic visits they need to have, are there any side effects and what are the costs. And increasingly governments and other payers are looking at the total cost of the episode of care. They're also looking a lot longer out. So probably a lot of you are familiar with, and I don't mean to pick on stent companies and so forth. Um, I'm not selling the stock short. I don't own any stock, so this is just hopefully objective. But the coded stents, all of the information that perhaps there are late clots associated with putting in these uh, drug coded stents. So early on when we had, uh, when we were putting the stents in, there really wasn't a lot of information. The, stent, the coded stents appeared to be doing a good job keeping the arteries open, but the problem is that later on there were these clots. So we have to look at the total economic cost, and second, we have to look far enough out to see what's exactly going to happen with the technology. Third, and this was, was mentioned briefly also, we have to start looking at biologicals. Biologicals are these so-called large molecules that are made of proteins, uh, as opposed to these smaller molecules which we know are manufactured uh, in, from the pharmaceutical industry. But the biologicals uh, have to do also with more personalized medicine. And there are generic biologicals in the works. The first one was human growth hormone, which was put out last year and was approved in Europe. The whole standards for approval of biologics is really very much up in the air. Uh, the EMEA in Europe is, is struggling with it. 
the FDA in the U.S. still hasn't quite made up its mind how to handle generic biologics. And then for products, there's obviously patent issues. And as you know, uh, there's been a lot of problems with countries that are manufacturing generics because they say that they can't afford it. And, it's a, and the drugs that are produced in those countries meet a pressing need. And the World Trade Organization allows governments to issue what they call compulsory licenses, which means that they can produce these drugs to treat uh, illnesses. Now, two of the major ones that, are, that, that um, everybody hears about is um, the Abbott drug, which is in Thailand, and the Merck drug in Brazil. Both of these are, are to treat uh, HIV AIDS, and you, you probably know that. Um, but again, trying to keep this up to date in yesterday's paper, it's not just the AIDS drugs, it's also cancer drugs that countries are getting into, and Thailand is indeed looking at some cancer drugs to say that they're going to produce them um, off the patent. And next is, you probably know also that there are some countries who had uh, manufacturing patents. In other words, the patents that they had were on the process of making the drugs as opposed to the chemical entity itself. India has come into the fold and is now doing what the rest of the world does in patenting drugs that are actually the, the, the chemical entities. Uh, a big wild card here, though, is if certain what are called developed, least developed countries start to look at these products, they have until 2016 to comply with World Trade Organization guidelines. So just a blue sky uh, off thought is that perhaps these, um, somebody could set up a plant in one of these countries and manufacture these drugs not quite in compliance with the World Trade Organization. As uh, Mr. Galil mentioned also, genomics is very important, personalized medicine. And one of the ways that we personalize medicine is by profiling the individual and finding out how they react to individual drugs. This is just the metabolic pathway. It's, very, it's called the cytochrome P450 system, and lots of drugs are metabolized in very individual ways uh, in an individual. And I, the, the day is coming where we can rapidly assess how individuals will handle pharmaceuticals. So what will happen in the not-too-distant future is that a patient will see a physician, and I'm not sure when this will happen, it might be the pediatrician, who will do an assessment of the patient and say, here is your bio profile. If you ever need the following drugs, here's the ones you should have, here's the ones you shouldn't have, here's the dosages that are most appropriate, here's potential side effects that you will have. Uh, we have some of this technology, not all the technology, and it's not as rapid as it actually needs to be. Now we talk about systems. And the growth of the systems is, is, um, is just incredible. And I, I, there's not enough time to talk about information systems here. I wish there were. That's another special interest of mine. It's a completely separate lecture. But in the EU, for, for example, um, the e-health market is currently 2% of the total health expenditure in Europe. But the potential to more than double in size, almost reaching the volume of the market for medical devices or half the size of the pharmaceutical market is there. Huge opportunity. However, what, what's, what's the downside of that is issues of privacy and security. And I mention this not because it's a global issue, but because if you're going to play in the U.S. market, it's an incredibly important issue. So as many of you know, we have uh, standards for electronic data interchange. We have rules that are, that are called HIPAA rules. And everybody in the United States who deals in the healthcare system has a unique identifier. Doctors, hospitals, pharmacies, even employers who furnish health insurance. Everybody has a unique number except the patient. And that's for reasons of privacy. So we can't have this comprehensive system for everything that we want. We can't have it unless people are willing to give up a little bit and turn over some, a little bit of power to the government. It's interesting because I, I teach in Canada as well and they have no problem with this. Uh, it's a difference. I mean, in Canada, as you know, it's peace, order, and good government. In the U.S., it's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. So everybody in the world, or, or virtually you know, you know, all other countries, have some type of national identity card. 
except the United States. And frankly, I don't see that happening. And that's a major obstacle if you're going to be doing business in the United States. Um, we'd like information to flow freely across countries, but of course there are restrictions. China, for example, is, is a major, um, major place. There's a firewall. Um, the system depends on 10,000 actual people, sensors. Um, they, they, they substitute um, different um, content. And uh, those of you who know uh, the George Carlin story about the seven words that you're not supposed to say on the television or radio, if, if you don't, we'll talk about it afterwards if, uh, if you can get me to do that. But China has 500 words that are banned if, if you uh, put that on the website. And then there, there are cross-border opportunities. So sometimes you have something like this, doctor without borders, meet patient without insurance. But I'd like to flip that a little bit and give you an example. Um, some of you from Europe know there's a European health insurance card, okay? And you say, yeah, I know, I know. Um, and what it's supposed to do is give you a little bit of portability if you're a member of the European community and you travel elsewhere. So what I did was I just you know, threw up here some of the countries where you can have at least some access through the EHIC. But there are some little fine points, and this is from the British site. So this is like those commercials that you hear in the United States where they start to talk really fast at the end. And so from the UK, if you look way down, it says uh, nationals of Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway are covered in all EEA countries but not Switzerland. People who do not have UK, EU, EEU, or EEA, or Swiss nationality are covered in all EU countries, but not Denmark, Norway, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, and, you know, and Iceland. So, I mean, you start to say, oh, my God, you know, I'm getting a headache here. This is supposed to be a card that gives you increased portability. What's going on? Well, there, you know, there, there are solutions. And I'd you know, like to have a German solution, since we have a German member of the audience. And there's a need that's here, and that is that two-thirds of the German population travel abroad at least once a year. Okay? So how do you handle their health care if this health card, European health card, is not working well? Okay? Well, there was one of the um, sickness funds in, in Germany, um, AOK Rhineland, said, why don't we contract with hospitals in countries where our residents would typically go? So they contracted with 14 hospitals, 10 in the Netherlands, 4 in Belgium, and they created a, a, um, a card, a Gesundheit card, excuse my pronunciation, uh, Europa. And what happens is that if you get sick, you can show this card at any of the hospitals. They can verify eligibility online. They can expedite payment, and everybody is happy. And it was so successful that another sickness fund, uh, Technica Krankenkasse, excuse my again, pronunciation, or TK, um, also signed up with this. So between the two, there's you know, 2.6 plus 3.8 million Germans who have access to this um, Gesundheitskarte Europa. So this was a technical solution, an information system uh, solution to a problem, even though the European system had this card. Now this is eminently doable, and this has to be doable, particularly because the European courts have said that people have the right to get health care across borders in, in the EU. Okay. Now, the next uh, fi final category is services. And with this, you know, if you diagnose your problem very well, Mrs. Johns, what do you recommend I give you? And actually, Mr. Galil alluded to this, is that people ought to know, ought to be informed. And this is really consumerism. It's listening to the voice of the consumer. Okay. Now, to pick up on the theme that you already mentioned, uh, you, you recall perhaps that, that Emerson said the world will beat a path to the door of the man who builds a better mousetrap. Unfortunately, Emerson wasn't a marketing genius because what he failed to say was, the person has to have a mouse for this to be useful, okay? So, you know, what is exactly the need that people have? Consumerism is listening to the voice of the customer and finding out what exactly do they need, what problem do they have to solve? And sometimes you have to go a little bit beyond what they say they need to identify what it is that's it's the actual problem. So that's consumerism. The next part is, although there's consumerism, each country 
has its own culture. Sometimes regions within countries have their own cultures. And we have to understand what those cultures are in order to come up with technologically feasible solutions. So I'm giving you some examples. Some of them are relatively local or of interest to Israelis. So these are, this is true. Uh, in Turkey, they sacrificed a camel on the uh, landing strip when they completed a project at the airport on time. Okay, the guy was fired, but nevertheless, they, they did this in, in, some, in a sacrifice. Okay? Um, Americans view Canadians as, um, you know, it says you're familiar, yet somehow strange, are you by any chance Canadian? So some people say Canadian or unarmed Americans, you know, but, 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 but it, goes, it, go, it go, really goes beyond that. And um, if, if you're interested, there's actually books comparing the contrast uh, between the cultures of, of the U.S. and Canada. My Canadian students get a kick out of that. Um, this is in Israel, and I, this is actually my picture that I took, in, in, it's in Tel Aviv. And I think it's only in Israel that you would see a Kabbalah, a Kabbalah store next to another kind of store. Um, it, just, it just hit me. I, you know, I carry my camera. And, um, and while that may appear, no pun intended, unique, uh, this is the United States. Um, you can see that in the back? Okay. Okay, so... Fred gets it a little late. Thanks. Okay, right. Sorry. You're not supposed to knock one of the sponsors. Okay. So, in, in, in putting that again in, in more real terms, there are countries where we need to look at different options because the culture of the country mandates that we look at different options. So, for a given problem, that not with necessarily only what the patient says, but when, once we finally investigate and get to the underlying problem, what we do about it is very much culturally dependent. You know, is it hematology, nuclear medicine, psychiatry, for example, I've done some work in the past in Argentina, the highest ratio of psychoanalysts to population in the world, as well as cosmetic surgery, maybe there's, there's some, you know, connection there. Um, and then finally, you know, in some countries, yeah, you just live with, you know, you learn to live with it. Okay, that's, that's the way it is. So what is the culturally appropriate solution to some of these problems that, that patients have? Okay. Next, was, as was also mentioned, see I told you it gave most of my talk here, is, uh, is medical tourism. And it's estimated uh, from the United States that 150,000, about 400,000 people a year, this is just from the United States, go abroad to get some type of medical procedure. And I remember being at a party um, about 25 years ago, and somebody, this was a, a Kellogg faculty party at, at somebody's house, and somebody was talking about this great entrepreneurial idea of flying people to Israel for medical care, which could be provided, you know, world-class medical care, we all know that, but at a fraction of the cost in the United States. This was 25 years ago, okay, and I said, you know, for all the problems, yeah, that's, a, you know, logistical problems, that's a great idea, and we're still waiting for, for that to happen. But there's tremendous opportunity. And then finally, um, huge demographic issues. Remember that first slide that I gave you, the matrix, and one of the issues was demographics. And population aging, and for, for those students from the United States, this is not misspelled. I use the spelling of aging for an international audience. Just, you know, it drives spell check crazy, but I, but I still use it. So the population is, you know, the world population is, is aging. And what's happening here is that it's going from what used to be more of a pyramid to what's being um, described as more of a beehive. So there's less at the bottom and relatively more at the top. And there, there's some reasons for that. And there's, there's you know, two reasons. We say, oh, yeah, people are living longer. But it's not just that people are living longer. It's that fewer people are being born. And there are, and, and there are currently 70 countries that, in the world that are less than replacement level in fertility. And by 2020, it's, 2025, it's expected there's going to be 120 countries. So fewer kids being born, more people living older, and those are really two very much uh, important reasons for the aging of the population. Over half the world's people live in Asia. So if you're looking for, you know, where, where this is at, um, it was clear to me about 15, 20 years ago 
that a great business idea would be long-term care in Japan, the most rapidly aging population of any um, industrialized country. And a lot of people who are interested in high tech just said, no, 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 it's not going to happen. It's not going to, you know, it's, 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 forget it. It's, you know, demographics are not interesting. You know, it's a huge issue in Japan now, the aging of the population for, for a great variety of reasons. The fastest growing segment is over 80. Um, aging is a condition basically of women, for obvious reasons. Um, but if you're looking to develop a product, this, this next um, sentence was, was really quite interesting when I found it. So while developed countries grew affluent before they became old, developing countries are getting old before a substantial increase in wealth occurs. In other words, the countries where there's the largest opportunity are the poorest. So whatever technological solution you have to come up, you come up with for aging, um, drugs, devices, procedures, whatever it is, it has to be not only you know, affordable, but it has to be really very low cost. And it's not because people don't want to pay for it, they really can't pay for it. So it has to be very inexpensive. Okay. So did you know that by 2050, to maintain a constant ratio between working and pension age populations, it would require Germany's population to consist of 80% immigrants or their progeny, so you better go, go back or maybe go back and have kids, or require the average Japanese to work until 83. Now, the good news is that today Japanese are living till 83. Okay, but I don't think that they want to have to work till age 83 in order to support the entire population. So, um, in, in conclusion, I don't want to give the impression, we shouldn't have the impression, that technology is a solution in itself that we can just go into the patient and just say, wow, I'm going to do all these things, and it has the word laser in it, and it has the word nano in it, and it will be just absolutely wonderful. That's not the point of technology. The point of technology really is not high tech or low tech, but just the right tech and to meet the patient's underlying needs. Um, it's talking about genetics and culture and, and, and sort of their, their relation to, to one another. Um, there's actually a new book, relative, it's called The Culture Code. If you're, that's, that's my quick answer, or my, my really quick answer that, that, that you might want to read. Um, genetics are sort of the necessary but not sufficient. It sets, it sets, the, um, it sets the basis for the solutions. So for, to give you a, just a very strange non-medical example, um, Eskimos, okay? Eskimos have to have, I mean, um, to live in that climate, have to have a certain amount of weight. They have to have certain genetics to live in that very cold climate. Eskimos, so that's the genetics that would set the stage. Um, the problem, let's say, would be housing. We all have housing issues you know, of one type or another. What the culture is, and culture is basically problem solving, the, the, the long learned behavior of populations and what they found solved problems. Their solution, their cultural solution is to build igloos. Okay? And that, that in just a very brief statement is a relationship between genetics and, and culture. Other, other quick questions? I don't know. It's, we may come to you later at the end. Fine. Okay, thank you. It depends if you want to watch.
the screen or not, up to you. Okay, so our next speaker is Dan Vilensky, who will present his creative model for better translation of academic excellence into fruitful global industry. Am I correct? And Dan promised me that he'll present himself, so I won't do it. Shalom. Um, at the end of uh, many of the uh, conferences that I attend lately, uh, as an industrialist, at the end of the meeting, I asked myself a question. Did I really get a return uh, on uh, my time investment during the conference? And unfortunately, the answer in many cases was negative because the, many of the conferences were too long and were not uh, focused. Um, in my presentation, I will uh, try to uh, uh, give just two, uh, two models of international cooperation. They might help uh, both the people involved and also the countries uh, involved. Um, but before that, I will give, uh, of course, some uh, background. Some of them was already given, so I will uh, skip it. Um, I have a concern. I looked at the, uh, oops, sorry, at uh, the brochure that we received today with uh, objectives um, of the organization. And uh, as uh, Professor Rando asks, that uh, he hopes that at the end of the of the meeting will have some uh, tangible uh, results. Uh, that's very good, uh, but I couldn't find here uh, one very important, it's on page four, there are ten items. So first of that is that uh, on the, all, all the ten items I didn't find some uh, measures of success which I think are very important, so people will be focused more. And second, I suggest to add another one, which would be drive international cooperation between the academia uh, and industry, and to add there some uh, measure of success like uh, for uh, business uh, cooperation uh, per, uh, per year. And in my presentation, I think this will uh, focus on this um, objective, which I think that uh, should, be, uh, should be added. Um, So uh, here I want to, sh to show one slide uh, to show that all my careers, what I did is international cooperation between Israeli uh, industry and the U.S. Uh, industry, and one of them is between uh, Israeli acad academia, which is the last one, and the, um, the Israeli academia and the uh, international uh, uh, companies. So the first one is that uh, here in Haifa, which is all of them, a uh, majority of them are in the semiconductor capital equipment. And what I want to show you is that uh, one person, I'm not that smart, was able that all my career, the result of my cooperation program were in the sales of that uh, program uh, in year uh, 2007 were over uh, $800 million. So the potential is there. If one person can do it, there are plenty better, much more uh, opportunities. That, so I'm very optimistic that the objective of the conference of international cooperation uh, can be accelerated. So the first one was Kulik and Sofa. Later it was KLA. At that time it was KLA. Now it's KLA Tenko. Um, then I uh, did uh, four years of, um, I was an industrial uh, matchmaker between Israeli and American uh, companies, even at that time, I did over 100 uh, joint, joint ventures. And the last one is Applied Material, which is an example of international cooperation, which I'll cover a little bit later. And the last one is a cooperation between um, uh, scientists uh, here in the Technion and uh, an American uh, company. Uh, but as a background, I'll say that uh, the image, I'm coming from a very uh, small uh, village uh, in Israel. And I was very proud. My parents had an orange grove, and I was an exporter. And during the good time, you know, there was traffic jam here in Haifa because, you know, the harbor was too small for that. And I was an exporter, and we made a lot of noise, Jaffa oranges. Look, look uh, the amount of um, uh, sales at the, uh, to the, uh, to that time and today, which is very small compared to the two charts that we have there, which is one of them is... Uh, um, a software, or electronic and software, and the second one, which is a newcomer, which is the 
the life science uh, area. Um, I think this was covered about the potential, the scientific potential, which is really great here in any, uh, any scale. And we spoke about the human resources. I had a chance to work also in the Silicon Valley for several years. And I would like to say that uh, uh, it's much easier. No, there are, there are several easy, easy uh, or advantage, disadvantage of running an R&D program here in Israel compared to the Silicon Valley. Uh, the quality of the people are at least as good as you can find uh, in the uh, Silicon um, uh, Valley. The di main difference here in Israel is that uh, the, everyone is an entrepreneur, everyone has an opinion, um, and you know, at, in the U.S. you start to say, here's our objective to reach that place, and you expect that all the people who will run in that direction and in Israel, uh, you will find some uh, skunk work under the table, and a few months later, the person who lost the battle at that time, when we decide about the strategy, is bringing on the table and show you that uh, you made a mistake and his, his system is better. But in general, there are plenty of uh, advantages. Um, there is also environment here, which is a very uh, good environment. The R&D spending in Israel today is, uh, is very high compared to the uh, GDP. I think it should be uh, even, uh, even higher because we are using the raw material, which is brain here in Israel. And also the GDP, as you can see from the chart, is, uh, is a pretty high uh, in international uh, standard. But I would like to, to show you here the confidence I have that uh, um, we are not doing enough here in Israel. I have here a list, a partial list, or no, should, no one should uh, be insulted if his company is not in the chart. But here are the companies that are operating here uh, in Israel. And I'm sure that uh, you can you agree with me that uh, many, uh, all kind of uh, world leaders uh, are, uh, are there. Um, and you can guess why I have the four uh, in, uh, in red. Uh, but uh, what is typical here, there are two, I, I showed several examples. There are many discussions about international company or international corporation here in Israel. The one that I mean, I just took some examples that the company that you have arrow on the, uh, the, the left-hand side of the, of the name are uh, uh, companies that brought with them, um, uh, brought with them a, a, a lot of knowledge. And here you have some other company that were based on acquisition of an Israeli. So what you can see here, that some of the can be initiated here and some of that can be, uh, can be uh, imported. Um, another way to look at that is uh, to see the foreign investment in Israel just in year 2006. And, uh, you know, I'm sure that you are uh, familiar with uh, many of them. Uh, probably you're not familiar with uh, the last uh, one, but it's on a personal note. This is the second generation. This is my son who started his own company and sold it about 12 months ago. That, so it's not just the, the old people, but also the, the potential with the young generation as well. These are some other uh, companies. But, uh, uh, and here is a, a quote from Mr. Buffett who says, I'm coming for the brain, not, for the, not for, the, uh, for the oil. And probably this should be the symbol for every other international uh, cooperation. In summary about what advantages we can, sh we can see here for co international cooperation or for companies that are, would like to have cooperation with Israel, is mainly in, uh, around the four uh, points, which three of them are major. One is the manpower, the availability of, of high-quality uh, professionals, the creativity. People are very creative, and they are driven by the fact that many of their colleagues uh, were uh, very successful. The evaluation, I have a question mark about that. Some of the evaluation probably is, is pretty high. And important is that since you are taking a risk, there are all kinds of uh, government uh, financial support that can be uh, given to, uh, to, for international cooperation. Now I would like to uh, speak about uh, two models. Uh, one of them is of an American company, that, uh, a large American company that is coming uh, to Israel to get benefit from the uh, technology that is available here, technology, product, and, of course, uh, the people. Uh, this is applied material. Applied material, just for information, is about a $10 billion company uh, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, they have a chain, a, a product, a chain of product with many links, and they were looking to expand and to find something that will 
complement their product line. They were making manufacturing uh, equipment, but they didn't have the capability uh, to measure the product or to have a quality, a quality control or uh, inspection of the devices coming or the product coming out of their machines. They want to expand, so the original, the original thing is to add a few more links at the end of the line, which in this case was inspection and metrology equipment. They identified here uh, two uh, Israeli uh, companies, in the, one in Yavne, one in Rishon and Zion, and uh, they acquired them. Now, as we all know, or regarding international cooperation, that uh, uh, frequently the, the acquisition uh, fails. And here I want to give uh, my first advice to people that are trying to do an international cooperation or to acquire companies, is that if you are coming from uh, overseas, if you plan to start an operation here and you plan to bring a foreigner to run the company here, you increase the probability of failure. It doesn't mean it will fail, but you're increasing. I think the first tool is to find a champion, an Israeli champion, to understand the culture, which will drive it. However, if you will have a, a champion that understands the Israeli culture and doesn't understand anything about the uh, U.S. culture, for example, he will, uh, he will fail. I have many examples of young engineers that uh, you know, they spoke in a different language. I mean, they thought they spoke English, but they didn't speak the culture, and they failed very quickly. So what we need here is that you need a, uh, a, um, a champion that will understand both, uh, both uh, cultures. And of course, you identify the, the, in, the, in case of light material, we identify the, the product. Um, we integrate it very quickly uh, to, the, um, to the culture of the American companies. And you'll ask me why I lost all my uh, hair. If you'll try, if you think that you can try to bring two, uh, we acquire two companies, Orobot and uh, Onopal, and you think you can take just very simply two hard-headed Israelis, put them together, form a company, at the same time train them to the, to the foreign culture, it is not easy, but it's worthwhile to, uh, to try. Um, and here, just in graphical model, what we had there, so uh, here you have a, uh, a company in the U.S. which have a missing link. And there are two Israeli uh, companies, one uh, Orbot, which has a, a very nice pro li product, li uh, product line of inspection tools, another company in uh, Opal that have a metrology tool, and they were integrated uh, into uh, one unit with uh, applied materials. Uh, during the acquisi acquisitions, the two companies together were making about $50 million, and eight years uh, later, the company uh, is making now uh, about $500 million with 1,300 people uh, in Rehovot, uh, and for every person in the plant there, um, uh, there are about two or three people that are giving services, either design or production or uh, other services to the, to the company. But uh, just to let you, so I'll not tell you stories, that uh, the, the company is in the inspection area, which is similar to find a, a golf ball in the whole uh, land of, uh, of Israel, or to find, a, since we are talking about uh, life science or biotechnology, that is like a, finding a white blood cell in a, a football uh, field. And, the, and here what happened in eight years, look at the nice uh, uh, line of uh, products, each of the products that you see here is in the range of about one to three million dollars, and it's really with ex extremely uh, high technology. So the conclusion from that is, I mean, conclusion. You say, here an example, if you are doing things right and you have an international cooperation, you can be uh, very successful if you are doing it uh, right. And I encourage uh, many of us to look uh, and to publish what they have here if they are in Israeli, and to try to find a partner in the U.S. or for Israelis to uh, try to find a partner in Israel is a great potential. The other example that I'm going to give is completely different. It's a, a, a startup. And here you have a startup which I call the Develop the Golden Egg. It's a company that was established here at the Technion by a, a professor, Professor Lipson from the physics department and he's a PhD uh, student, which I think is supposed to be here someplace. Um, they identify a great opportunity, a great uh, a potential for a product in the life science uh, area. Um, 
They were uh, originated here uh, in uh, not far from here in the Goodwood uh, um, Park here. But they and, and they called me and asked me, "Can you help us? Can you help me uh, to start a company or do something?" All three of us did not know how to spell life science. We took a technology that uh, we developed for the semiconductor uh, business, and the, uh, the student, uh, the PhD student, found an application in the area of, uh, of life science. Now, the, it was a higher risk. I mean, the, the venture capital, uh, or what I called the uh, Hon Batuach in Israel, didn't want even to speak with us because you know, we didn't have a good track record in this field. The company uh, was looking for a, how to come quickly into the marketplace, how to reduce the risk, but most important, we were looking for money. Uh, and as I mentioned, the venture capital didn't want even to look at in our uh, direction. So my, uh, I mean, there are many models for success. I believe that success is international. Uh, cooperation and to find a strategic partner or what I, I call it, how to, to convert this golden egg at the academy into golden nugget at the, uh, at the um, uh, industry. So we identify a company in, uh, in California named Biorad, no connection to the Zisapel brothers here, uh, Rad uh, business in, uh, in Israel. It's a U.S. company which is relatively large, 1.3 public, $1.3 billion sales public uh, company. And they were looking to complement their product line. They have a chain of product, and they were looking for uh, They were looking for new technology and potential increase of the market uh, share. And uh, of course, what we need in all different models, you need uh, luck. Or like my previous boss told me that in a high-tech business, probably also in the life science business, that you have 95% uh, um, luck and 5% ingenuity. I think he was almost uh, correct. So I had, I had luck. We, let, we came to the company at that time, they identified the market, but they failed in their development, and immediately they invest in the company, and about a year ago, they acquired the whole Israeli company. So if you go now to Goodfield Park here, you will find it's not proteoptics anymore, it is a biorad, and the result is one plus one is much higher than two. The company is very successful, and this year, probably first year of sale, they will sell about um, uh, over six million uh, dollars, and they have to duplicate double the sales in the next, every year, in the next several uh, uh, years. And here's an, another example. I showed an example of a very large company, a U.S. company coming and acquiring company here. And here is a small company that we initiate from Israel acquisition in the, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the U.S. And here is a product that they have, and the product is being sold now for about $250,000. Uh, and as important is that they have consumable, which are the uh, small, uh, small biochip, which are being sold for about uh, over $200 um, a piece. Uh, if you want to demonstrate it in a more picturally wise, that here you have the biowad in the Israeli company, and here are the golden eggs, they identify it. They, if you do it right, uh, they will start to generate very quickly, it will generate uh, revenue. But more important, not just revenue, important, uh, not just sales, but also uh, profit. And as important is that the founder are also getting some uh, dollars from that. The bottom line is that everyone is happy. And if I have to, uh, this is my last slide, if I have to speak about what it is for success, success on international level, that you need the people, you need the product, and you have the infrastructure. And all of them are do exist both here and in different, in different countries. If you design it probably for a company that will um, build to last, you can be uh, very successful if you find the right strategic partner, which is a model that I believe in. So bottom line, dare to try, there are opportunities. Thank you. Dan, Dan, before you go, Dan, we have questions. Uh, I'll take the opportunity any to Any complicated the, questions? I want to be the first one. Do you have any recipe to bring the large company, the global company, to Israel and to stay in Israel, to, to leave the activities in Israel, rather than to sell, selling companies and moving everything abroad? Okay, I'll answer with a, with a story, in, not in, you, in, the, in your field, but it will be exactly for that. <coughs> you know Intel, right? 
and uh, you know also pro probably the biggest competitor. Who is the biggest competitor of Intel? Some know it's AMD. Now Intel, I mean, if you if you are not from Haifa and you drove here today, you saw the in the in the Matam there in the uh, industrial park. Uh, Intel is celebrating. They are building now even a new building. They already have two or three thousand people, and AMD is losing the market because majority of the latest uh, microprocessor chips are coming from Haifa. Now the question is, I'm asking you all, why aren't, I mean, why they're not here yet? I will have to say something else. I myself paid Intel $1,200 to start their operation here. How do you account for $1,200? Very simple. They received twice $600 uh, a million dollars uh, as a grant from the, gov from the government in order to build the fab in, in uh, two fab in Kriyat Gat. And since they're probably about, I hope, about a million uh, taxpayers, so I paid twice $600, $600 so, uh, to Intel. And I asked this question, and to answer your, your question now is that, yes, one evening I uh, sat at my home and I uh, wrote uh, the president and the chairman of AMD, I wrote him an email. And I said, look, your competitor is celebrating here in Israel, in, in Haifa. They have also a fab in Kriyat Gat. They got all kind of money from uh, our government. They are getting about 100, 100 students each year from the, the best student from, uh, from the Technion. They are developing the microprocessor competing uh, uh, with you. And I'd like to tell you also, the last bullet was, that if you start an operation here in Israel, and you announce it in five minutes, because of the organization chart of, um, of uh, Intel is very uh, low and the Israelis are very aggressive, want to grow. In five minutes after you publish in the paper that you are planning to open a design center here in Haifa, you are going to have engineers and managers waiting in line to get a job. <coughs> and the last, uh, the last bullet, or the last sentence was, I do, it's, a, it's a Israeli chutzpah, is to say, I wrote, I don't understand your strategy. How can Dan Vilensky tell AMD the $6.5 billion that they don't understand the strategy? And then I understand that I'm going to be in Santa Clara. If you want to hear from me why I think so and what is my solution, I'm willing to meet with you. Uh, the, I thought they would throw it to the pay. I got a phone call from, from them, and they said, I'm going to give you five minutes to express it. Now, as a regular person, I would say, oh, it's, it's an insult. I can't, I can't, I'm, go, go, I'm not going to do it for five minutes. I, I, I answered to him, five, four minutes will be sufficient for me. And we met there, and the meeting took three hours. Because I came with uh, why to do it. At the end, <coughs> this is the end of the story is that um, we set up a meeting here in Israel, and the time for the meeting was the second day of the Lebanon war. So they didn't want to come, but they said, Vilensky, I know that you have a war here. Will you be willing to, uh, to meet with me at uh, Dresden, which is in Germany? So I flew to Germany and we met, and you know what? I can declare victory, something will come up. So the answer, just identify the right partner and have the Israeli food spend. Okay. Yeah. Any more questions? Well, uh, any other questions? I don't have too many stories. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you, Mike. And, okay, now we'll move to the 
next session, which is Next Generation Development at the Nanobio Interface. And here we'll have three young scientists in the area of Nanobio Interface. The first one is Dr. Hussam Haik. I'm Haik and I'm of the Department of Chemical Engineering here at the Technion and I will be talking today about one of the main uh, projects we, we perform in our laboratories and this is a development of artificial olfactory systems or the so-called in more technical terms uh, electronic nose devices that are based on nanomaterials for diagnosis of cancer detection. Basically the electronic nose device which we develop is can be applied for a wide variety of applications, starting from detection of explosive materials, continuing to nerve agents. Also, it can be applied in the food industry and also in the clinical industry. And today I will be focused on the cancer detection because cancer uh, is the second leading, uh, I cannot transfer the slide. Cancer is the second leading uh, cause for death in the world, immediately after the heart and the cardiovascular diseases. For example, in Europe, uh, every year, more than 3 million people are diagnosed with cancer and more than 1.7 million people die from the same disease. At the time, the lung cancer is the most popular uh, form of cancer, both in terms of diagnosis and both in, in terms of uh, death rate. This is very sad uh, data, however, the worst data which I heard is that the survival rate within the five years period after the detection of the uh, cancer is ranging between 10 to 20 percent only for most of the cancer types. And the statistics warn that uh, this very low survival rate is, uh, could be attributed basically for the uh, absence or a non-existent of a, a techniques which can diagnose the cancer at the very early stages of the disease, namely before the formation of the tumor. And the statistics also expect that one can actually increase the survival rate to more than 80% if one can find such a technology. And this is what actually we try to do in our labs. Actually what we are trying to do is develop a device which first of all be very easy to obtain. Namely it's not limited only for hospitals or to clinical institutes but rather can be available also for every physician or for every uh, person who would like to have this uh, uh, device. Also, we prefer that this device could work on a non-invasive way. In other way, we don't need uh, to take any uh, urine or uh, blood uh, samples, but rather we can utilize the breath. And of course, we need uh, one of the uh, criteria of this device should be inexpensive, so it be, can be uh, available for uh, anybody and any person. <laughs> And this, and this is our vision, right, uh, which is shown here on the slide. Actually, our vision is to develop electronic nose device, and we call it electronic nose device because it works on the same mechanism as the human nose or the canine or, uh, uh, olfactory system. And uh, our vision, as shown here in this slide, is that to, to let the uh, people exhale into a device, and as a result, the uh, device can tell whether the person is healthy or has a cancer, and in the case the person has a cancer, then what is the type of the cancer, whether it's lung cancer, uh, breast cancer, or prostate cancer, and must, much more importantly, what is the stage of the disease, namely before the formation of the tumor or after the formation of the tumor. Actually, we have started uh, our uh, research in the laboratories, and we have very, very promising uh, data. And uh, before I just show you a couple of uh, slides on uh, the main results, I will explain how these electronic nose devices work. Basically, electronic nose device consists from an array of sensors, where each sensor in the array has different properties than the other sensor, as illustrated here from the different colors. <coughs> Once we expose this array of sensors to biomarkers, volatile biomarkers of cancer, then each of these sensors transmit a signal, where each signal which we transmitted from each of these sensors is different in its shape, its intensity, and other features than the other sensor in the same array. 
Then we take all of these uh, uh, signals and uh, uh, analyze them using a pattern recognition. And then we can correlate between the stage of the disease, the type of the disease, and the signals. Of course, one of the main important parts of this electronic nose device is the development of an array of sensors, which is very, very sensitive to a very low concentration levels of the biomarkers which found in the breath or the exhaled breath. Basically, these uh, uh, volatile biomarkers found uh, in part per billion level of concentration. However, most of the current technology is limited to the PPM. Uh, there are some extra, uh, extraordinaries, but still they are much uh, very, very expensive, and we are looking for inexpensive technology. And toward this end, we develop a, a, a two main categories of sensors. The first category is called chemical resistors, which are based on uh, nanoparticles which are coated with organic molecules. And the basic idea here is to deposit between two electrodes a thin film of gold nanoparticles which are coated with organic molecules. In this case, because the gold nanoparticles has a conductive properties and the organic molecules has insulating properties, then upon applying a voltage we have a finite resistance. Once the biomarkers are found in the, uh, from in the uh, exhaled breath are absorbed within this film, then the, it's, uh, the biomarkers swell the film, namely they increase the distance between the adjacent gold nanoparticles and as a result increase the resistance. We measure this resistance or difference in resistance and this is actually our uh, uh, sensor response. A rough estimation about the fabrication cost of this sensor is around $4 only. So if you, we use an array of 60 sensors for detection of cancer, then we will not exceed $1,000 at the end of the whole process. So it should be very applicable uh, for uh, technological applications. If you expose, for example, one of these sensors uh, to a 1 ppb hexan, then we get this signal. As you can see, before the exposure, we had a given resistance. It's very stable. And once we start to expose this uh, sensor to a hexan, then we have an abrupt a change in the resistance. And this change in the resistance stay very stable during the whole time of exposure. And at the end of the exposure, it goes down to the background. This difference between the resistance is our, a, 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 is our signal of response. As you can see here, we can, we can modify the signal response time, also the signal intensity by changing the core diameter of the gold nanoparticles and also in other cases by changing the uh, organic legions absorbed on the uh, nanoparticle surface. If we take, for example, 32, uh, nano, uh, 32 uh, sensors which are composed from gold nanoparticles and coated with different organic legions and we expose them to a wide variety of compounds, then, as you can see here on the graph, then we get a, a, a very good discrimination between apolaric molecules and polaric molecules. Inside this category of apolaric molecules, we can distinguish even between molecules which have very similar chemical and physical properties. For example, we can distinguish between n-heptan, n-hexan, n-octan, and isoctan. These are very similar compounds but still we can distinguish between them. Also, we can distinguish between polaric molecules according to their dipole moment, as you can see here, between ethanol and ethyl acetate. Please note that each dot here, which you see on the graph in a given color and a given shape, it's to repeat the measurement again and again, just to assure that we have, a, that we obtain a result a, beyond the experimental error. And this is what indeed we can a, a achieve. If we take the same array of sensors and ask a, a, a one healthy a person and one person with cancer to exhale into the device, then as you can see in both cases we get different results. In the case of the healthy a pattern, then we get a, a signals which are shown here. And in the case of the cancerous pattern, then we get a, a signals which are found on the other part of the chart. Namely, in other words, we can distinguish between the different uh, between these two different states. 
in a very good manner and beyond the experimental error. Again, here every dot, here, every dot which are shown in the graph is to repeat the measurement again and again just to assure that we are beyond the experimental error and this is what we succeed to do right now. Right now we have a, today we have a, an, a, a, collaboration, a collaboration with the oncology department of the Rambam Hospital here in Haifa where we do a clinical a, experiments using our devices just to assure that they also work in non-ideal world, namely in clinics also, not only within the lab, a, within the lab a, a boundaries. The other a device which I'm going to talk about, a, which we develop also in our laboratories, a, is based on silicon nanowires. And the basic idea here is to take a field effect transistor and to replace the conductive channel between the source and, between the, source and the drain by a nanowire of silicon. Once the current passes from the source to the drain and a, a molecule is absorbed on the surface, then there is a change in the current and we can detect this change in the current. And as a result, we can uh, correlate between this change in the current or the conductance and also between the type of the molecules. And we do so, first of all, by taking off the oxide from the surface of the silicon oxide by a technique which was developed in our laboratories and terminating the groups of the silicon nanowire directly with organic molecules through a very strong silicon carbon bond. This silicon carbon bond is, have high oxidization uh, resistance towards, uh, towards ambient conditions. As you can see here, we don't have any oxide on the surface. Just to show you, this, um, this is the as is synthesized nanowire. This is the oxide there, as you can see here from the shell. And we succeed also to etch this oxide and terminate the surface in very good way. Then we take these nanowires, of course, and we uh, integrate them with four, uh, with four electrodes in a format of field effect transistor. And as you can see, by this technique, we can increase the uh, performance of these devices relative to devices which are based on nanowires but coated with silicon oxide layer. Right now, if we take these devices and expose them to a variety of uh, biomarkers, for example, hexan at 40 PBB, then you can see that we uh, get very good uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And as you can see, the signal-to-noise ratio also depends on the organic molecules absorbed on the surface of the silicon nanowire. For example, here, if we increase the length of the organic molecule, then we increase the absorption from the organic phase, if absorption within the organic phase, and as a result, we increase also the signal. Also, as you can see here, these devices can be uh, sensitive to a wide variety of uh, odorant molecules, starting from apolaric molecules such as hexan, octan, octan, isoctan, and also they are uh, very sensitive to uh, polaric molecules, as shown here by the uh, examples of uh, ethanol and the ethyl acetate and THF. Lastly, a if we look here at uh, the same example which I showed previously and ask uh, two people, one healthy person and the other uh, has a cancer, to exhale into these devices, then we can see very good differentiation between the signals obtained in both cases. And in this case, even the differentiation signal or the discrimination between the different states are much better than uh, what we obtained with the gold nanoparticles. Our vision right now is to uh, combine between the two methods which, we, uh, which I just talked about and uh, to develop this further and to, take, uh, and, uh, to assure that it works in clinical, uh, in clinical environment also. By this I, came, uh, I come to uh, the last slide of conclusions that using nanomaterials is a very good uh, approach to uh, diagnose cancer even at the very early stages, and if we can do so, then we can increase the survival rate to more than 80%. Thank you for, for your attention. Thank you. Okay, there are questions. In... Excuse me? Could you say or explain a little bit on the different biomarkers for different cancers? 
there is mostly there is no different biomarkers for different uh, cancer. Let's say uh, the following: if you look on the healthy breath and cancerous breath, then they have the same pattern of compounds. However, in the cancerous breath, we have higher level of concentration of these compounds. So, by being very sensitive to the level of concentration, we can distinguish between cancer and non-cancerous uh, breath. For different types of cancer, the, the composition of the pattern, namely the ratio between the different compounds which found in a given pattern is different. So, by being sensitive to these uh, different combination, we can also uh, be this, uh, very sensitive to uh, the wide variety of uh, uh, cancer uh, types. I should mention, we are not talking about one biomarker or two biomarkers. We are talking about 80 to 120 different biomarkers which characterize the lung cancer or the other types of cancer. The presentation implies that it's possible to carry out this analysis without knowledge of the previous uh, medical history of the patient. Is that really so? Uh, this is what we expect, but I cannot answer this question right now because we need to do the clinical experiments first of all. But this is what we hope. I have a, uh, a brief uh, comment and a question. Um, just to inject the fact that the reason we have this particular session with the uh, young researchers is to demonstrate that, hey, there's some really exciting new stuff coming, and I think we've already begun to see that, and that's great. Um, secondly, and it relates to the second part of what we're trying to do here, where we're trying to do some additional work related to your project, and just to ask the following question, to what extent you have begun to think about, and maybe we could use some help in analyzing the risks that are inherent in what you're doing as you move towards application and commercialization of a product like this? Of course, there are much more established uh, techniques uh, in the industry to diagnose cancer. For example, you have CT, scanning CT, and uh, mammography, many, many equipments. However, uh, we emphasize that here we can uh, diagnose the cancer at the very early stage of the disease, which cannot be achieved with any other uh, technique. Here it's very difficult to convince people that we can achieve this uh, and how we can achieve this. Because if we develop something right now at, to detect the early, very early stage of the disease, then we need to have a reference. And right now we don't have this reference equipment. So this is the one of the main difficulties, but we have a very... A, a, we have a very good research plan, which we are doing right now, also uh, in collaboration with the Denver Clinic, uh, also with the Rambam Hospital, how we can attack this problem. And we have started to get uh, promising results. I hope we can uh, talk about it in, the next, uh, in this next conference. Okay. Okay, now this is the last, last question. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, my name is uh, Robert Moscovich. I'm a PhD student at Ben Gurion University, uh, <clears throat> basically in machine learning. And I wanted to ask, I understand that uh, uh, a patient uh, gives his breath for some period of time, and then you are using uh, machine learning techniques like neural networks. Uh -huh. <clears throat> but do you look at the, this period of time uh, from your uh, graphs, I saw that there is variance of the signal a long time. How do you handle it? Because neural network doesn't consider the basically, changes. Basically, we didn't uh, use in these graphs the neural network. We have used the principal component analysis, which is very, very fast uh, technique to analyze the results. However, it's not the most accurate technique. Neural no ne network uh, analysis should be much more uh, efficient. Uh, but it's more time consumable. 
So right now we are developing, uh, one of my postdocs develop uh, a new software or new machine learning which can also decrease the time to 30 seconds for analysis of all the compounds simultaneously. Yeah, I didn't refer to runtime, but how do you handle the time? But we can discuss it later probably. Okay, we can handle the time in terms of hardware, which we can, which we, where we succeed to do it quite good, and we have a response time of one to two seconds. And uh, in terms of the uh, machine learning uh, time uh, of operation, so if you like, we can discuss it afterwards. Yeah, be good. Okay, thank you. Professor Marcel Mahlouf for, for the Department of Biotechnology and Food Engineering. Um, we will introduce Thank you. Good morning. And sorry if I would skip some slides because I was told to shorten the talk from 30 to something like around 20. Um, actually, we have several projects in our lab, but today. What? Hmm? Okay. But today I will share with you two projects. One on the tissue engineering field that is already in a, the patent is in a phasal stage. And the second one is the nano delivery system that we focus today, which I cannot elaborate a lot, but as much as I can, I will do it in the short term that I have now. So the first field uh, of tissue engineering, what we aim is uh, to find something new, something that it was not renovated already, something that will fit what we call the therapeutic um, um, that currently, to my opinion, to the other opinion of uh, other researchers, is missing from the clinical field. I will start with the problem and go and uh, explain how we address this problem. As we all know, Hussam said cancer is the second leading cause um, in, the, in the world, so heart failure is actually the most uh, problematic health problem that we are facing today. And when we have um, heart failures, the answer today is transplantation. And, as an, and all of us know what is the answer for uh, transplantation and what are the problems for transplantation. One of the diseases that actually account for heart failure, or the main disease, is what we call micro myocardial infarction. In this case, the patient suffers from adequate blood supply to the myocardial tissue. And then the tissue suffers from ischemic, sorry from um, ischemic areas and the tissue start to die, the myocardial tissue start to die. And unfortunately, this is one of the tissue that doesn't know how to regenerate itself. Eventually, the patient go to uh, have a heart transplant. So there are different applications, different approach, different attitudes. What we are uh, trying to, try to um, um, use is the tissue engineering field, which is um, a very interesting field rising slowly to my uh, opinion, but we have already some product in the market. Ho hopefully also this one that I will share with you will be in the market. In tissue engineering, you need two components. You need the biodegradable, you need the scaffold, should be biodegradable or not. You need the cell, you need to compose the two of them, and you need to have the final structure. Still sounds simple, but very complicated. In the terms of the cell that we need to use, we have uh, for heart uh, transplantation, we, ha we may have some uh, option, but unfortunately none of them is still in the clinic, of course. Cardiomyocytes do not divide, so we cannot use them. But other option that usually in the, uh, today we are talking about is, for instance, with the chemo stem cells to try and mimic the heart function. And of course, embryonic stem cells, which has their own problem also. In, the field, in this field, we have different polymers, synthetic, biological polymers, uh, and natural ones. Each one of them has its own advantage and disadvantage. The problem is we don't have one ultimate uh, scaffold that can have what we need from it, which means should be biocompatible, have the same strength, stem, uh, same durability, has the same properties that we have in the body, and actually will uh, speak with the cells and uh, eventually form the organ that we are interested in. What we thought about is going to the pig. The pig is very popular. The porcelain uh, tissue is very popular lately. And actually take the heart tissue, slice it for now. Uh, we have method for smaller pieces, but slice it for now. And then uh, try to take out the scaffold that actually holds this um, tissue. Now, what is nice with this tissue is the 
compatibility between, between the tissue from uh, taking from uh, proteins to human in terms of the size, composition. Uh, the scaffold itself is so compatible to the human being that we are talking about basis of 99% homologicity between the, uh, the porcelain uh, tissue and uh, the scaffolds and uh, the human being one. Second of all, it's available. I don't need cadaver. I don't need other patient. I don't need anything to wait for. I can just take it, process it, keep it on the shelf, and use it. So the process that was developed is uh, composed of different uh, steps of uh, detergent and enzyme solution. Of course, every one of them approved by the FDA not to have any problem with this uh, uh, process. And eventually we can also radiate it, we can sterilize it and keep it. What eventually we get is actually if we start from this material, we can start with any size clean it, if we don't clean it well, we still have some fraction of cells there which will cause a problem, immunological reaction, eventually rejection. So it's very important to clean it. What is nice with this heart tissue is also that, for instance, from the epicard, we already have the blood vessel in it, which is the main problem in tissue engineering, how to supply uh, blood to the tissue that we are engineering. Eventually, when we dry it, it looks like that, and we can make it in any shape. So for now, as you see, I'm not going to build a new heart. This is a, a dream come true maybe in uh, several uh, years, but uh, for now, we are talking about patches or uh, other component of uh, the heart. Of course, we now we need to um, uh, prove that this uh, heart or this piece of uh, collagen uh, scaffold is clean of cells, otherwise it won't be accepted. So in, in the biological field or in the life sciences field, we have different ways that show that actually what you see here, that our, our matrix is clean, has this collagen what, uh, structure that we have, no cells, this is from the beginning before we clean it, no cells, no debris, nothing, just a clean uh, scaffold, primarily composed of collagen, collagen type 1. Let me skip this. Also, we um, uh, confirmed it by other means, and let me show you more the uh, ECM structure. But if we do ECM, scanning electron microscopy to this uh, metric, is, sorry, we see that it has a beautiful composition, a beautiful network, a three-dimensional network in, in the inner side and in the outer side, and which can repopulate with the cells of interest. What is very important is that we need to keep or maintain the structure of this scaffold. We need to, after all this cleaning process and enzyme degradation, we need to make sure that whatever was in this matrix will stay. The two components that are interesting, uh, that uh, we are interested to live in, is of course the collagen, which is the main co uh, component, and the second one is the glucosamine glycan that actually are the ones that communicate between cells and show that the cells are viable and deposit on, uh, the, struct on the scaffold. If we look at this uh, chart, at this uh, table, we can see that this is tissue before we clean it. We have a certain amount of collagen. After we clean it, we are still kept with more than 95% of this collagen, meaning we are uh, left with intact structure. In terms of glucosaminoglycan, the main uh, source for it is the cells themselves, and we have some of it on the outer side of the cells, so once we clean it, we expect, and we receive as we ex expect, a decrease in this glucosaminoglycan. We hope that this glucosaminoglycan will return once we see the cells on this uh, scaffold. Of course, we also need um, to, be able to make sure that this um, scaffold strong enough, elastic enough, durable enough to stand all the pressure that we have in the body and that the heart needs to stand. So we developed also a system that can measure this. The system exists, but we develop an apparatus that will help us to, um, sorry, to measure all these um, properties. I will go briefly on the slide showing that actually what we get is that in terms of, uh, in terms of our metrics, we have high elasticity. We have also low hysteresis, and also in other uh, stress-release break assays, we have also shown that, again, it's a very elastic uh, uh, material. And one of the main uh, assays that we do is how much pressure I need to put in order to break this scaffold. Actually, we placed here a high, a very high pressure that we even don't have in our 
physiological um, um, environment. So what we see here that uh, also the, this um, metric hold, and most importantly, okay, okay, I don't want to go back. Most importantly is the durability, the one that I skipped, meaning I can place force on this metric again and again and again, and it will keep and maintain its property. We try to see different cells, uh, of course, as the popular one, the cardiac fibroblast, the mesenchymal stem cells, and uh, of course also the cardiomyocyte. Unfortunately, these cells, as I said, cannot grow, but for proof of principle to show that they can grow on it, we can have it. So let's go and see what uh, happens with this matrix and the cells. As we see here, uh, the cells repopulate uh, in terms of ours, the repopulate the matrix, it even uh, shrink the matrix because it secretes so many uh, components, so many biological components that actually uh, makes the matrix to shrink, meaning the cells is active very nicely. Also, a uh, special ECM that, um, special sense that we show that the cells line up this matrix very beautifully, like it, and uh, show um, very nice morphology. What is most important is viability, of course, one, what we see here that the viability of the cell is maintained for a longer period of time. The cardiac fibroblast mostly, cardiac myocyte goes down a bit with time, that's known about these cells. And uh, all the parameters needed, meaning standing of the cells, and see the beautiful uh, striation that we see here that are features for cardiac cells, meaning, again, cells are forming the morphological features of the tissue, meaning the heart tissue. Also here, and let's keep all this staining, go to uh, eventually what is more important. And uh, what is important is does this uh, cells uh, synchronize, does they will uh, beep on it, they will like the matrix form a synchronized tissue. And what we see here that my card decided to <coughs> sit it on uh, this scaffold, and I'm talking about a very big scaffold. Usually in the literature what you see is a very small scaffold. Here is a three centimeter length uh, scaffold. The cells are beeping on it. We don't need anything to give them, nothing special, no electrical uh, stimulation, no growth factors, nothing. Just in a petri dish, um, showing them beeping all uh, the time. And what is nice is the white collagen that is becoming uh, more evident, which means the position of the gag on it. Of course, that we also measure this, but uh, and the growth of the mesenchymal stem cells, which is the current one that we are using, which are going very nicely on uh, the cells, on the scaffold. Also, of course, we need to, buy, um, to build a bioreactor for that because eventually I want the cells to line down and see if they will behave accordingly. And in this case, it doesn't work, but fine. What is nice with, with this preliminary bioreactor that it mimics biomagnetic uh, pulses that uh, stretches of the cardiac tissue. Here it's very fast, just to show the, the example of what is going on, but we can stretch the matrix so actually mimic what the heart does to the cells and see if they orient appropriately. And of course, all the cells are produced on the scaffold, produce all the gene that actually are uh, features of this um, heart tissue. In t finish. In terms of immunological issue, we already transplanted this uh, matrix. What we see here, no immunological for now, reaction up to four, eight, and um, what we have for now is six months. So I'm finishing with that, and I cannot uh, talk too much on the, and this is the final stage of it that we can mimic also blood vessels growing from this tissue. Let me skip. We have the same thing on blood vessels, and although I didn't find the translation from uh, Hebrew uh, to English, but uh, the Bible uh, explains very well um, what we are trying to do. So I'll stop now. The nano will wait for another part. Yes. Okay, there are questions, and yes. I also have questions. Okay. A couple of questions. My name is Effie, I'm from Microphone. Rainbow, Rainbow Effie. Medical. Talk exactly. I'll, I'll try to talk louder. Um, the question I have was, how do you plan to use it as a product? Do you envisage, envisage, envisage um, 
a cell culture laboratory in the hospital that will create a matrix? So what's the form of product that you have in mind? The second question, did you try to use uh, patches of commercially available collagen instead? For the first question, actually, uh, we don't expect the hospital to do that. You can use the metric, the matrix as it is, as a patch, and um, you can have it stored on the shelf. You don't need to do anything with it. In terms of having, for instance, in the future, cells from the patient or from other source, yes, you need to have some two weeks of culture on this scaffold in order to re-implant it. But um, according to what we see today from the clinical setting, not only maybe not with the heart, with other um, uh, patches or other scaffolds, sometimes the body repopulates the scaffold by itself. In the case of the heart, we have this problem, but uh, we are talking about a patch that is readily and available for the uh, physician to uh, uh, suture to the, or glue to the area of, uh, of uh, the ischemic heart. The other product that I didn't show is like blood vessels that we have in the same format. In this case, for instance, you just need to suture the blood vessels or to do the surgery and let our body to grow the cells because that, for instance, we have evidence that our body knows how to do that. But it's a product that can be ready um, on the shelf. It doesn't need any uh, long handling or expert um, to work with it. You, have, you had another... Can, I was asking, did you use commercially available patches? Yeah, we compared, I didn't see in the show, in, um, in these slides, um, but we, we compared this uh, matrix to other collagen uh, product that we tried to make and other collagen product that are in the market. The difference was still in the mechanical, mechanical features of the product, and second, in the remodeling of the product by the cells. Unfortunately, taking only the protein itself, the, con the collagen, trying to make a scaffold from it, not always we have all the technique to make it as beautiful as the, already the human being or the body did it. So um, the results comparing to the collagen matrix was much better than this one, than the, the collagen itself, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry, we'll have okay. to keep the questions for the break because we, have, we are short in time and we have another speaker. And the next speaker is Dr. Dror. Selecta, where is he? Okay. Hi. He's a senior lecturer in the Technion Faculty of Biomechanical Engineering. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here and to uh, address this audience. Um, you know, when I was uh, doing my PhD, I, uh, I often noted that academic research uh, tended to be uh, very narrow-minded in some sense because in dealing with problems in medicine we tend to focus on very specific issues and when other issues come up or when other questions come up in the uh, in the overall goal of the project we tend to brush that off and say well somebody else is working on that so when I set up my own laboratory here in the Technion five years ago I decided to be a bit more practical and a bit more pragmatic in my approach and so what I'd like to share with you today is uh, how that we can approach a medical problem uh, in academia, uh, be successful in treating it with a practical solution, and translate that technology out into the industry. So I come to you primarily as an academician, but also as a founder of a company. So the problem, the clinical problem that we are going to try and address in the next 10 minutes is uh, a problem of traumatic injuries, focal injuries. And usually the problem with this indication is that if the injury is very large, uh, I don't know if you know, but in immediately after a traumatic injury, uh, the entire volume of the injury becomes filled and occupied by a blood clot. And if that volume is very large, the blood clot is structured in such a way that it breaks down rather rapidly because of its open pore network. And so the blood clot may take a couple of weeks to break down, but a very large injury will take a couple of months to repair properly. And if there's no synchronization between the breakdown of the blood clot and the repair process, particularly in tissues that are slow to heal, like cartilage and bone uh, and uh, uh, cardiac muscle, uh, you get what's called scar tissue. And you've all seen this. You have this on your skin. And on the skin, it may be okay, 
but uh, scar tissue in your cardiac tissue, the cardiac muscle, scar tissue in cartilage, and scar tissue in bone and nerve uh, is certainly not good enough to do the job. So we try to address this based on the structural dilemma that is posed by the natural blood clot. And so our solution was to develop not a cellular therapy, but rather a biomaterials approach, but a sophisticated biomaterials strategy. And the way we do that is by taking the main composition or component of the native blood clot, which is fibrinogen, you can see that here. Uh, we take that fibrinogen component, but we want to change the structural properties of it so that we can, first of all, slow down its degradation. And secondly, we want to be able to control the way it is degraded so that we can keep that, say, biosynthetic blood clot in a large traumatic injury for a number of months and slowly have this material degrading and stimulating the healing response. So we take the fibrinogen molecule, and I'm not going to go into any detail here, and we denature it so that we get this biological molecule, which we can then attach onto that a synthetic polymer. And it's important to note that the synthetic polymer gives us pretty much all the control features that we'd like from this biomaterial system. So we can change the composition of the material by changing the synthetic constituent and retain the biological information present by the, the protein backbone. Now, in order to turn this biological, uh, biosynthetic molecule into a material that can be implanted, we use a light-activated chemistry with a photo-initiation system, much like is used in a dental office with synthetic fill fillings. And what we get is this three-dimensional hydrogel material that, again, has the biological activity of the blood clot, but now we control the rate at which it degrades and the manner in which it degrades. Uh, and without going into any details, I'll go directly into some of our preclinical results. What we see here is the typical focal injury of cartilage layer. The cartilage is that white tissue, and it usually gets uh, damaged as a result of sporting injuries or car accidents, and you get that big gash in the tissue. Well, what the surgeons will do nowadays is they'll actually clean that out a little bit and form little tiny holes into the uh, subchondral bone to form a bleeding response there. The bleeding response will fill up that defect site with a blood clot, and within a couple of weeks, you'll have a scar-like tissue forming there. And that provisional scar-like tissue is actually going to take uh, a couple of years until it degrades. So it gives a little more life to the, to the uh, joint, uh, and the pain uh, subsides a bit, but it's a short-term and bad solution. What we do, we'd like to do is use our material, implant it into that defect site, and regulate the healing response so that instead of a scar tissue, we'd get natural sustained healing of the, the joint. You can see the operation here. Uh, and this is six months afterwards. This is a sheep osteochondral de defect model. And you can see that the cartilage is resurfaced. Uh, by the way, a control animal would have a completely osteoarthritic knee, which looks very bad in comparison to this resurfacing. So if you're thinking that this is a resurfacing that doesn't look uh, very good, this is quite good compared to the, the control. But the bottom line is that we look inside of that, by the way, we have here uh, four injuries. You can see uh, here the, the four locations where we made the injuries. And you can see in the middle of that cross-sectional view, here is our implant. And this implant here, if you look histologically, is situated right in the middle of where the gap used to be, right there. The gap used to be right in that defect. And you can see new cartilage and new bone filling that injury. And this implant is being slowly degraded after, this is after six months, slowly degraded. And as it's degrading, it's in its wake, you get this inflammatory response and healing right around it. If we change the composition, make it a little bit faster degrading, here's the faster degrading implant. You can see that it's hard to detect it. Here's the implant in the implant site right there. And all that injury is now healed with new bone and cartilage. So this is a nice type of healing. This is what would happen in a control. This is an osteoarthritic control group. Whoops. What happened? And you can see the control has scar tissue right in the middle of that uh, injury site. So it's quite impressive. And we also can characterize the type of cartilage that's being repaired. This is a type 2 collagen stain to demonstrate the fact that this is a repair, fully functional tissue as a result of this very synchronized process of healing. We've slowed down the healing response, but we've been able to get functional repair tissue in place. So what is the potential for other types of tissues with this technology? We looked at a number of different applications, including cardiac applications in Malsev, 
has done a very nice job of giving me the introduction uh, that uh, she, did, she did so nicely in it, the infarction of uh, cardiac tissue. Well, here we clearly thought of using this injectable material to treat the cardiac tissue. And you can see that we can inject the material using light activation. The light will pass through the cardiac tissue, and we can get this, the material to, uh, to uh, integrate into the cardiac tissue quite nicely. Here it is here. I'm showing it with the arrow. And the idea here is that you can have an injectable uh, material as opposed to, say, a patch so that you can do all this minimally invasive. The problem, of course, is that we didn't see at the degradation of this material, we did not see, unfortunately, any regeneration of cardiac tissue, uh, presumably because the cardiac muscle requires some sort of a rejuvenating st cellular element. So the, the way we decided to approach this is actually to test the biocompatibility of these materials with cardiac cells. And uh, the movie is not going to work, so we're just going to pass the movie. Uh, we already saw beating cells today anyway. Maybe this one will work. No. Okay. Um, so the, I'll just summarize. Well, maybe I can. I'll show you just one movie. So we, we took cardiac cells and we've, we encapsulated them inside these materials and grew them in the incubator for a couple of weeks just to validate the fact that this material isn't biocompatible enough so that it doesn't kill the cells. And can you, you get an impression that the, the cardiac tissue becomes highly contractile after those two weeks in culture. Whoops. I'm not quite sure what's going on here. My, my PhD advisor used to say that, are you, it, that it is, right, right. can you stop touching this mouse? Thank you. <laughs> I'm trying to control it and you're trying to control it. Um, I was saying my PhD advisor said that it's, it's uh, human to error, but it takes a computer to really screw up, so I suppose that's, that's true here. Um, let's go back to the presentation. Are you controlling this again? No, okay. Now it's stuck. So we were able to validate the fact that this material is compatible enough to deliver cells, and clearly the next step here is to inject the cells into the heart muscle. And I'm just going to skip through a couple of these slides for, for, the reason, for time constraints. And w what I'm going to show you is now the results of the injection of these cells. I'm terribly sorry about this. I always insist on using my own computer for presentations, but it wasn't possible today. You can see the injection of these slides here. And um, we, can, we can see that the, the cell graft integrates quite nicely with the cardiac tissue. You can see two injections here into the cardiac muscle. And again, this can be done minimally invasive so that you can inject the cells. And clearly the cell source is going to be an issue, uh, but you can inject them and they integrate quite nicely with the cardiac, surrounding cardiac muscle. And um, uh, the cells even take on the orientation of the cardiac muscle presumably because the material carrier en enables them to do so. The last application that I'd like to show you, if this computer were to move, mm -hmm, is uh, nerve regeneration. In nerve regeneration, typically what happens is you have a nerve defect, and the surgeons will bridge the gap between the two uh, uh, ends of the cut nerve. But if there's a very large defect, the gap is not able to be bridged by simple procedures, so that the surgeon will have to actually use a conduit to guide nerve regeneration from one end of the cut nerve to the next. And that conduit actually has to provide enough uh, information or 
uh, template for cells to migrate in a unilateral direction from one, from one point to another. So we thought about using these biomaterials as a bridging conduit, and we, we have done... We have done studies with nerve cells, and what you see here is a time-lapse video of nerve cells coming from this end of the video into hydrogel material. And you'll note that there are glial cells here, and the nerve cells are the tiny little nerve uh, endings here, the axons. And you can see them penetrating, and this is all happening three-dimensionally. One of the problems here is that Yes, the, the nerve regeneration occurs within this hydro, hydrogel conduit, but the orientation is random, and you can see that the cells, this is four days' worth of culture, you can see cells are going in all different directions. And like I said before, the application of nerve regeneration requires a unidirectional uh, growth. So what we've done is we've actually applied um, a micro-manipulation technique towards creating channels. And this is a commercially available laser microdissection system, which you can use to create tiny little ablations within the hydrogel. So if this is, the, uh, if this is that nerve clump, these little channels are created using this moving stage and li focused laser beam and creating tiny little channels inside the uh, hydrogel environment where the cells will actually prefer to go into this, this uh, channel. You can see we've created the channel here and the cells come into that channel and preferentially migrate in the channel so that we can control. We've done some more complicated geometry than this. We can actually control and guide the way the cells come into that channel, and then, of course, we val validate the fact that these cells are, in fact, nerve cells. You can see in this image here, the, the DRG nerve cluster allows the growth of the cells in here, and then we stain these cells to make sure that they are, in fact, nerve cells. So hopefully I've showed you uh, uh, more... Uh, all-encompassing approach to dealing with specific medical problems. Obviously, there are many people involved in this research, and uh, this is a very interdisciplinary approach to trying to treat things in the, in the short term. I mentioned that uh, I am a founder of a company. Uh, the company is focused on c commercializing this technology for orthopedic indications, and we are uh, soon approaching the clinical phase of this uh, study. And it's a very interesting perspective to look at it from both the academic side and from the industrial side, and give, gives some very uh, unique uh, challenges on both sides that one has to deal with. So thank you for your attention, and if there's time for questions. Thank you. We can have a few questions. Oh, now you can. <laughs> Well, fibrinogen is actually um, a biologically active protein. In order to create a blood clot, it needs to have its tertiary structure intact. But we actually use a different cross-linking scheme in order to form the, uh, uh, the, the hydrogel that we make as an implant. So it doesn't need to be in its tertiary and quaternary structure in order to become a, a, a clot. Um, but the other interesting thing about fibrinogen is that as a clot material, once it degrades, it actually is, becomes biologically more active as fragments or fibrinogen degradation products. And there we don't compromise at all the fibrinogen degradation products because the denaturation simply uh, reduces the disulfide bonds between the three fragments of fibrinogen. So we retain the biological information of the degradation product, which is exactly what we want to elicit a sustained healing response in the body after implantation. Any more questions? Okay. Okay. Uh, I just have a simple question. What strategy are you following to uh, raise uh, funding from different kinds of sources for support? Yeah. Uh, you know, when I, when, I, when I started off on that path, um, I was hopeful that I would be able to find a partner like Dan and, and be able to uh, do things without uh, the... Uh, the help of uh, financial assistance of venture capital. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask Dan a, a question, but I'll, I'll pose it now, that all of your examples are really examples that don't require very strict regulatory uh, pathways. And 
In a regulatory arena where you have to go through FDA or CE mark, uh, there really is no getting around venture capital. So we use the venture capital funding. We, we're, the company has raised $7.5 million to get through uh, CE mark. And, and unfortunately, that's, uh, that's part of the game. I wish there was a way to, to bypass that, but there just isn't in this, in this uh, medical device industry. Yeah, I have to admit that I didn't look at the binational funds, but I, I, I estimate that you need about $20 million to get a product like this, 20 to $30 million to get a product like this th through the FDA, and that is a conservative. Some, some people put it at $100, $100 million. So we're talking about that scale of financing, and that's something that's very hard to, to come up with, even in this kind of a cooperation agreement. Yeah. Thank everyone. Uh, it was really fascinating, and I was hoping to launch a discussion relating to commercialization of this uh, applied uh, science. Unfortunately, we don't have time. However, I saw an entrepreneur talking to a scientist, so this is uh, probably one outcome of this session. And I wish you all a very good success. Thank you.